everyone. I'm Christian Blavo, the managing editor of IndieWire. I'm so excited to be discussing here with in creative company, David Ajala, star of Star Trek Discovery season three and season four. Season four has launched on November 18th and is rolling out new episodes every Thursday. Uh, this new season is really exciting and really puts the spotlight on your character book, David, in, in a big way. Uh, what, what excites you about where, where book is this season? Um, thank you for the introduction, Christian. Much appreciated. That's very kind. Um, I tell you what, I'm really looking forward to delving a little deeper into this guy's world. Because in season three, we, um, we were introduced to this character. Um, we saw him navigating this new world um, uh, through his lens, of course, because he was the window, he was the doorkeeper to this new world. So the audience were able to experience this world through Cleveland Booker and Michael Burnham. And then we see him kind of semi-integrated with Starfleet, but still protecting and keeping his autonomy. Um, but what I'm really excited about is going into season four, we see Cleveland Booker operating from a place of survival, deep, deep survival. And he's in very unfamiliar territory and he has to deal with a lot of pain, a lot of grief. And it'll be, um, it'll be quite raw, but I, I think um, exploring these gray areas of grief and of pain is really important. And so relevant to our current moment. Yeah, um, absolutely. I felt like, you know, even though the show is set in the 32nd century now, Star Trek has always done an incredible job of connecting to our world and reflecting things that are happening in our own world. And yeah, grief and, and, and death, you know, are big themes in this new season, certainly for what your character experiences and uh, not to get our, ahead of ourselves because only one episode is aired, but uh, certainly something major happens at the end of that, that first episode. And uh, yes. I'm excited to see, you know, where, where the character goes from there, because as you said, he was our introduction to this new timeline. So for anyone watching, if you have not seen Star Trek Discovery, this show began as a prequel series to the That's original right. series set in the 23rd century. Uh, then it jumped ahead 900 years to the 32nd century where the Federation barely exists. And so Book, David's character, was sort of the entry point, the, the person who introduced us to this whole timeline. And, you know, David, like the way I see it, like Book, he's sort of a, he's like Han Solo as a cat person. You know, he, <laughs> he's this courier, he has his own ship, he's a great pilot, um, you know, but unlike Han Solo, he has a real connection to his home world. Um, yeah. He uh, is also a bit of a loner in a way, like at least Han Solo always had Chewbacca. But yeah, sure. um, I like, how, how do you go about describing this character of Book to people who haven't watched the show? Well, you, you actually described him pretty well, Christian. You know, um, I think with, um, it's funny because more recently, a lot of people have said, oh, Book is like the um, Han Solo Star Trek. And um, I'm really happy that that wasn't pitched to me in the beginning of um, saying yes to the show because that would have been way too much pressure. Um, do you know, in essence, Cleveland Booker is someone who operates from a place of selfless love, duty, and um, humanitarian deeds. And I think with someone like Cleveland Booker, he likes to make a difference in his own way without necessarily wanting anything back. It's part of his survival, it's part of his DNA. And going into season four, we're really gonna be able to see and understand so much about what makes this guy tick and why he is the way he is. Um, season three is a very fun introduction to this character. The stakes aren't as high sometimes, and we really get to embrace and enjoy his swagger and his off-the-cuff energy and um, his, dare I say, how he rubs certain members of Starfleet up the wrong way. It's fun because it reminds us that we're all different, but our differences is to be celebrated and not um, to, to be uh, frowned upon or to be ostracized. I think our differences is what makes us unique, and that's the wonderful thing about Starfleet. Everyone is different but was celebrated because of our uniqueness. And our uniqueness is enough. And what a beautiful thing that is. You know, I mean, really Star Trek has meant so much to me my whole life. 
Um, and, you know, I'm curious about the path that, that brought you to Star Trek ultimately. So let's back up a bit. You're a kid growing up in London and yeah. ultimately it was your math teacher or, or as uh, you guys in the UK say, your maths teacher who yeah. uh, <laughs> <Hold on. laughs> you want to pass. I, I worked at the BBC for five years, so I should, oh, I should know. Myself. Okay, uh, okay. But it was, it was your maths teacher who, uh, who actually got you involved in acting? Yeah, um, God rest his soul, Mr. Sen, Indro Sen. He goes down as one of the best, most influential teachers in my life. I never used to like maths, still don't like maths, but he made it possible. And for that, I really commend him as an outstanding teacher. Um, he was aware that I had way too much energy in school. Around the age of like 13, 14, he suggested to me, he said, David, with all the energy that you have, you should try and channel it into um, doing acting. And I know how you like the girls and you'll be surrounded by a lot of girls. And dare I say, you may be popular amongst the girls if you're able to pursue it and if you're any good at it. So he was kind of like the catalyst for me to embrace acting. But I think I already had it in my bones. Um, growing up in a Nigerian household, my mum and dad moved to the country in the, um, in the 70s. And I think they immersed themselves with very British culture and um, African-American culture, because there was definitely more black um, uh, talent in, you know, acting, music, various genres visible in comparison to the UK. So my mum and dad latched on to the Carry On movies and um, Eddie Murphy. <laughs> so, you know, she kind of liked the fact that I kind of looked a little bit like Eddie Murphy. So I feel I kind of lean into that. Um, I lean into enjoying being the class clown, um, being the joker in school. And, you know, it's performative. When you have an audience, something kind of switches on. So I think that's how I kind of got the bug. Jump many, 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 many years, Christian. Um, after doing drama school, doing a few plays in the UK, um, TV gigs, film gigs, uh, I get this call from my team. They're in New York. My manager, my agent, are in New York at the same time. And um, they meet up to give me this call to say, look, the guys at Star Trek have this new character. Um, they're really excited about this character. They wanted to speak to you about it. Um, that's all we can say. They haven't given us any information, but they just want to speak to you directly. So I had this conversation with Alex Kurtzman and Michelle Paradise, who are the showrunners, co-showrunners of Star Trek Discovery. And... Um, the way they spoke about this character, it sounded so fresh and fun. And I think I was at a stage in my life where I felt a bit, dare I say it, rebellious. So there's something about the synergy of this conversation with this character that connects with my spirit. And I thought, if I don't do this role and someone else does, I probably won't be able to forgive myself. So I think it was instinct, a bit of ego <laughs> that made me go, I need to do this. And I'm so happy that my yes was yes. Oh, that's so fantastic. And, you know, you've, you've done some other sci-fi shows over the years. You were on Supergirl. You did a show called yeah. Night Flyers. Um, yeah. You know, but it's so interesting to me because would you say, you know, that your first love, like when you were in school, your first acting love was was the stage, you know, before you, you got into film and TV? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there's just something wonderful about, being on the stage, um, storytelling on a stage in front of an audience, you, the chances are the majority of the audience, you don't know who they are. And you step on stage and they say, we have paid money, or maybe we've gotten a free ticket, but we're buying into for the next two hours to believe what you tell us. Mm -hmm. This world which you're creating and which you're living in and inhabited in, or you're inhabiting, um, we believe it and we're with you. That energy I find magical, Christian. And you're on the stage and even in a play that we did recently, we worked on, um, worked on a play called One Night in Miami and it was at the um, Don Mar Theatre. We performed it 20, 2017, 2016. The play was written by Kemp Powers, directed by Kwame Kweyama, who's the artistic director of Young Vic Theatre. Um, it got nominated for an Olivier Award. We were so proud. 
so so proud of this play because this was a play. Brown, I played Jim Brown. Yeah, that's right. You know, and you know, Christian, with this play, we have Jim Brown, Sam Cook, Malcolm X, and Muhammad Ali, and some of the lines in the play are very unfiltered and authentic painfully honest painfully true may make people feel uncomfortable you know that's life mm -hmm. and it's okay to feel a bit uncomfortable because yeah, feeling yeah. a bit uncomfortable can actually push us towards being the better versions of ourselves and to perform that play and to speak these lines of these of these words that these characters are feeling and expressing them and seeing audience members in the front row wiping away tears laughing, holding their faces. That's a magic that you can't recreate. So even though I'm doing TV and film, I always try to remind myself of the muscularity, the memories, the emotional memories of that energy of being on the stage, because it's magical. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And you know, it's, it's interesting to me because obviously you don't have an audience present other than the, your fellow cast and, and the crew, but you know, when you're doing a show maybe like Star Trek Discovery, you know, there, there must be a lot of things that aren't there that you have to imagine are there while you're playing book. In a way, is there is there a connection to your theater work? Because obviously when you're on stage, you have to imagine so many things that aren't there and make it real to the audience as, as well. Yeah, I think to even more so, Christian, I feel um, doing... <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm a little hoarse because I had a I had a very busy weekend. It was fun. It was busy. Um, so recovering, and it's a few days later. That that's a good weekend. <laughs> it was glorious. Um, you know, with working on a show like Star Trek Discovery, like you said, season three is nearly a thousand years into the future. We are literally creating canon from moment to moment, or we have the invitation to create canon from moment to moment. It's a really exciting time in the franchise. Um, we're in space. We're, we're pondering on ideas which we haven't discovered, and we're literally discovering them from moment to moment. As we're on set, there are many things, like you said, that we can't see, so we have to imagine it. So for me, when it came to the preparation and the groundwork of building this character, he had to feel so authentically tangible as possible, because so much stuff is recreating and pretending that it's there. The only way I could really feel comfortable and grounded is to really have an energy of a character that could sit in any world and still have the presence of authenticity. Authenticity. That was really, really important for me. Because yeah. I, I think some people shy away from science fiction and genre specific projects. It's because it actually requires a lot more work for it to be invisible. You, you, sh you shouldn't see the work. The work is invisible. You shouldn't see the effort. That's so interesting. And that level of preparation that's required in order to make your performance sort of invisible, like you're, you're perfectly integrated into this world, into the space. Absolutely. Um, you know, that, that requires a lot of preparation and a lot of effort. And, and, you know, it's just then making it so you don't see the effort, you know. That's... Absolutely. You know, and it, it's, um, it's fun. But I, I really do believe, Christian, with, with um, great, because a lot of people talk about method acting. But I think everyone has their own method. My method is to prepare as thoroughly as possible. But then when you step onto that set, have the grace to let all that preparation visit as and when it needs to and when it wants to. You don't force anything. You just let it be, you know? Um, I think it's important. So presently in the moment, if someone gives you a gift, you can catch that gift. Yeah. It doesn't go over your head because you're like, no, no, I have to do this like this. You're like, no, no, no. I receive that gift. I hold it. it feels good. It's there. I yeah. Give you something back. It's there, Christian. It's waiting to be discovered. Oh, that's, that's so cool. That's so interesting. And, you know, it, it's, it's funny. I've noticed over the years, like, so you also performed Shakespeare. Uh, you did Hamlet and Midsummer's yeah. Dream with the Royal that's Shakespeare right. Company. 
And I've noticed over the years that specifically a lot of Shakespearean actors end up going into sci-fi or superhero <laughs> movies, you know, um, genre, genre stuff in, in general. You know, a lot of these franchises are really powered a lot of times. But I mean, you know, like the Marvel Universe, you know, you've got Anthony Hopkins and, uh, you know, Tom Middleston, and you've got all these, you know, actors who ha have that kind of background, which you yeah. have as well. And I'm curious, what, what's the connection there, like among Shakespeare and superheroes, sci-fi, like, like, is it the timelessness of the themes? Is it the, the bigger than life personalities? Why, why do actors from something considered so highbrow mm -hmm. often end up in these very popular franchise entertainments? That's a really good question. I, I do think it's a combination of um, comfortably being able to storytell within a very specific genre um there's something about being classically trained and being exposed to literature like shakespeare where you have a real kind of awareness of the language that you're using where the style of storytelling i won't say it's larger than life i'll just say that it has many 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 layers of consideration many many layers of things that you have to consider from the verse speaking to the rhythm to the flow um, so that technique, I feel, opens you up to a world of possibilities. You should be comfortable with it. I think Shakespeare's language, though it may seem intimidating, I think once you embrace it more and more and more, it puts you in a place where you're very comfortable with language, with storytelling, with characters, with big costumes. So now you take those same skills and fit it into the Marvel Universe or science fiction, um, there's just the comfortability and confidence which allows you to troubleshoot in a more specific, effective way, I feel. Without sounding too cerebral and um, wordy, I, I think that's why a lot of these actors transition very smoothly into these genres. I think that's so interesting. I really do. Uh, it's something I've thought about for, for a long time. and. Uh, mm. That's one of You're one the of first the person that's asked that question. Oh, You're really? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, and I, I mean, just looking at, at the, the work that you've done <clears throat> prior to Star Trek, yeah, I, I mentioned a, a couple shows, you know, Supergirl Night Flyers that you've done, but like one of your first credits, you were only like 20, 21 or so when you, when you were doing it was The Dark Knight. You, you, you have a small part in Christopher yeah. Nolan's magnum opus, in case, you know, so people can go back and like see what you were doing. Who were who, who you playing in that film? I played, it's so funny that you should mention this. Um, of all the roles and projects I've worked on, I kid you not, Christian, um, The Dark Knight is the one role I get recognized for the most across the board in various parts of the world, so many different countries. It's The Dark Knight. And, um, uh, I played a bounty hunter. Uh, my scene was with Heath Ledger. Um, absolute joy. Scene was with Heath Ledger, um, Michael J. White, Chucky Venn, and Bronson Webb. Um, it was one of those experiences I'll never forget. You know, um, Heath Ledger for me has to be one of the most talented, kindest actors I've ever worked with. When I first met him, he introduced himself to me. Um, and then I remember that same day we were rehearsing the scene and, you know, it was very, very relaxed. And we were just working out different ways of doing the action with throwing a knife and catching it. And he would always check to make sure that everyone was comfortable. And if something wasn't working, we could just tweak it. Cut to being on set. And prior, I have to say, when we were rehearsing, he wasn't in any kind of costume. He was just in his sweatpants, T-shirt, he had a bandana on. Very, very relaxed and very open. And, you know, he had this real energy, this youthful, playful energy. Cut to being on set. Um, he's in costume and in character with the makeup. And not much was spoken about on set. Everyone knew what they had to do. Chris Nolan was there. He's employed his actors. He knows, you know, the strengths that they have. And we just started shooting. Didn't really rehearse, straight into shooting. I remember after each take, it was just quiet on set. Because it almost felt sacrilegious to talk. Because Heath Ledger was 
doing something so special. No one really wanted to make small talk. So Heath, in his wonderful joker, playful way, would, um, in between takes, to break the atmosphere, which was very quiet and still, he would do these terrible, terrible party tricks, you know, balance coins on his elbow and then catch them. So he's got a bit of an audience and he's putting these coins on his elbow. He's catching them. And he picks up four more coins and now he's got six coins on his elbow. He catches them. And then ah, he picks up eight more coins and he's got a whole stack of coins on his elbow. And he goes to catch them and they all just splatter everywhere. And then he goes, hmm, shit. <laughs> and then without missing a beat, we just resume and continue filming. Um, you want to talk about craft and um, skills, method acting, technique, um, discipline, practice, doing your rudiments. He set the bar standard for me. He really did. Because even during rehearsals, he had this like notepad where he would make notes. And I saw the way he interacted with Christopher Nolan. It was like, he was like a student, you know? And his, his curiosity and his... Um, drive to always want to do better and to collaborate really set the bar standard for me and um i'm that much more richer an actor and a person because of that experience of Heath Ledger ah oh, what a great story seriously that that's so interesting and i mean one of the best what an experience to have because i mean that was one of your first movies right i mean that was yeah one of, yeah how did how did was, you get involved so my um, team gave me a call. They said, hey, David, um, we've got this script which has come through. It's for a feature film. I'm like, amazing. I really wanted to do a feature film. They're like, the film's called Rory's First Kiss. I'm like, it could be called Rory's First Birthday Cake. I'm in. Let me audition for it. So the sides come through, which is just a little segment of, um, of um, uh, not even the script, because it's, it's dummy. There's a dummy scene that they give you to audition with. So I've learned it, gone in, done my audition, did nothing, nothing of it. Two days later, got a phone call. David, you got the gig. I'm like, get in. Loving it. I know I'm about to work my first feature film. And then um, two days later, my agent calls me back. She says, David, um, we've done our research. Uh, the film is called Rory's First Kiss. You're actually going to be working on the new Batman movie. David. Hello? David, you still there? <laughs> I'm, I'm like, yo, Alison. Alison Lee was my agent's name. I'm like, you got to give me a few minutes because I just need to catch my breath real quick. Um, it was such a special moment because I had no idea how wonderful and awesome and cinematic that movie would be. What a blessing, man. What a blessing. That's so cool. That's so cool. And, you know, I love that, 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 you know, that's, uh, you know, a small role and yet people recognize you so much for that part. Just, I mean, it, it, it's a testament yeah. to the power of the movie. Sure. But it's also a testament to your own ability to, you know, the way that you have such a presence and, you know, you've brought that presence now and so powerfully to Star Trek, including, yeah. I would say, you now what's so unique about your, your character on Star Trek is that you are now like the, you know, you're the bedrock, you're the foundation, you're, you're the core part of the best romance that there's been on a Star Trek show or movie or anything Star Trek since like the wow. 90s. That's, Christian, what do I say? That, that's amazing. It's true, that's it's true. Cool. And, you know, that's thing. I mean, that is such a unique part of your character that he is this romantic lead. He's not just a heroic character, but he's a romantic lead for... Uh, Captain Burnham, Sonequa Martin Green's character. Uh, and, you know, that relationship is such a unique dynamic that we haven't had on a Star Trek show in a very long time. How have you approached that? And, and I mean, did you, did you recognize that, yeah, this is pretty rare for Star Trek to have this, this kind of relationship? Do, do you know what? Um, uh, that, that's so wonderful. I think what I found so special about this relationship with um, Michael Burnham and Cleveland Booker is... Um, these two people, we have to remember how they met. They meet in the most hostile way possible. He's on a mission doing his thing. 
she's also on a mission doing her thing. They're both on a mission serving a purpose far greater than themselves, but yet in the moment they couldn't see that. In the moment, Cleveland Booker saw Michael Burnham as an inconvenience, an enemy of progress, and an obstacle. But yet, that meeting, you know when the stars align and two people are in the right place at the right time? That's what it was with Michael Byrne and Cleveland Booker. And it just so happens that these two people bring out the best in each other. Cleveland Booker has empowered Michael Burnham to be the master of her own fate, to find her identity outside of Starfleet in the most wonderful, healthiest way. Michael Burnham has empowered Cleveland Booker to see the benefit of being part of a team, of a family, of a home. I think their relationship is so special because of the respect that they have for each other, for the love that they have for each other, and the way that they challenge each other to always stand tall, comfortably in the skin that they're in. I've said it many times, Christian, behind every great woman is herself. Michael Burnham doesn't need Cleveland Booker, but it just so happens that these two really do bring out the best in each other. That's so well said. And I think it's so, I think it's so meaningful for fans of, of the show to hear that because I know that this relationship is something that people have really loved. I've certainly loved seeing it. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's just a, it's a really powerful thing. And, uh, you know, working with Sonequa, you know, how, how have you, like, how have you together, like, found ways to, you know, sort of pump up your chemistry or, like, get on the same page with certain line readings, the way that certain scenes should go? I mean, she, she, I've interviewed her before and she's fantastic and seems, she you know, just the, the greatest, but what's your, your working relationship like? Um, Sonequa is just wonderful. She, she's, um, really really talented actress and just so happens to be a wonderful human being at the same time um it's very easy working with her it really is she's fun very hard working and it just feels like she cares so much about the work about this world about the fans that she's so fully invested and i, I believe that being able to approach work from a place of care love deep gratitude respect really elevates the quality of the work because you're able to put ego aside a little bit. Having an ego is healthy. Balance is healthy. You need to have a bit of an ego to stand on set, to speak the scientific terminology and words tripping off the tongue and command the audience to believe the words that you say. You need a bit of ego for that. I also believe that you need balance. And I believe in the world in our working environment, which is definitely led by Sonequa, we have all of those elements. But the one element that we have in abundance is inspiration. We feel inspired working. Working with Sonequa is fun. We earn it every time. Our relationship, we didn't really speak too much about our relationship as characters. Um, our main thing was just to always look out for each other, to be there for each other. And to um, always encourage each other to stand tall, very important. And I think from that purity of wanting to connect one way or another, it'll inform the decisions that we make as our characters develop. Um, but that being said, Christian, the course of true love never did run smooth. And um, Michael Burnham and Cleveland Booker's relationship will get challenged. I can, I can Most imagine. Raw, challenging way wow well if that isn't a tease for fans to you know get them just even that much more excited about season <laughs> four the first episode is available now on paramount plus and uh gosh yeah i david seriously there's so much there's so much there like if you're an actor or you're someone looking to make it in the film and television worlds there's so much here that i think just from what you've said that people can learn from. I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us, your perspective on the industry, on the, on the shows and the movies that you've, you've worked on. Thank you so much. It's really been an honor. My pleasure. Thank you, Christian. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for your thoughtful questions.
Thank you.